Okay, I think we can start. Hi everyone, it's nice to see so many people here. Uh, after, like, it's our uh, return to Barbara where we started Grafiel Wrocław and we are here again. So welcome everyone, uh, my name is Marcin. Hello, hello everyone. I'm Gerard, also helping Martin. So we are be your hosts today. Uh, on this event. So this is our anniversary, like 10th edition, so we are very excited about this and we have pretty impressive lineup for today. Uh, so before we go to the agenda, I'd like to say a few words about or organizers of this event. So uh, this event is m organized by Mirumi Software and Sailor Commerce. We are two companies from Wrocław. Mirumi is a software house and Sailor is a startup that builds uh, GraphQL first uh, open source e-commerce platform. Uh, so we do care about open source a lot. Uh, we use it every day and we also contribute to the community. So we also care about sharing knowledge and that's why we do this event. So it's great to have you. Um, so maybe let's take a look at the agenda for today. Okay, we have a lot coming today. 
And we are we are going to have a hybrid event. We're going to have some talks happening here um, live and some talks happening remotely. So first, we will have a talk from Michael Litek. I don't know if you know him. He will be talking about how to use TypeScript and GraphQL and will be creating a CRUD API um, by using a library that we will be um, seeing in more detail. Then we'll have a remote talk with Jamie Barton. And all of these talks will have a time uh, to ask questions. So we will pass a microphone around. So if you have a question, uh, just raise your hand and someone will come with a microphone to you. And we are also going to give you a T-shirt. So if you have a question, do, do ask um, that. Don't be uh, shy. And for last, we will have a third talk that will happen here from Tim. And it's going to look into how we can improve the performance of our GraphQL APIs. So very interesting talks, all of them, and all followed by a QA. and a um, After that, we are going to do a break, small break, and move to a panel. And that panel, we are very happy that we have the co-creator of GraphQL, Lee Byron, joining. And is going to join. He's actually, like, we have a video of him. Like, we wanted to have him here, but he was not able to join, which is, like, we are, we are very sorry about this. But he recorded a video for us that we're going to play. And that will be the introduction for our panel discussion that we will have, uh, where we are going to try to answer the question whether GraphQL is a trap or what are the common misconceptions about GraphQL and a few more topics. Uh, and for the panel, we will also have a very uh, nice lineup. We will have Patrick Zawadzki from Sailor Commerce. Uh, we will have Michael Steib, who is a member of GraphQL uh, Technical Steering Committee, and uh, Johannes Schickling, who is founder of Prisma. Yeah, very exciting uh, lineup. We are going to be asking some questions uh, just to kickstart the conversation, and uh, feel free to join at any point. There will be some um, questions that may raise uh, a heated conversation. Let's see, let's see how you feel about that. And then we are going to close the event with an after party. Uh, the after party, unfortunately, it will only be for the people here. There won't be a stream after party, so that will be the end of our event. But we are hoping that we are going to have a great time uh, learning from the talks and also sharing any questions that you may have. All right, I think we can start with our first speaker. Yeah. Michal, are you ready? So please join us and. Yeah, a round of applause for Michal Litek. Okay, take it away. Thank you. Uh, today I will be talking about uh, GraphQL and beyond um, because GraphQL gives us uh, endless possibilities. Uh, I will focus mostly on generating the GraphQL CRUD API. Uh, but before we begin, I will let me introduce myself. My name is Michael. I'm a senior software developer, but I'm, so, I'm also a creator of the Graph Type GraphQL framework. Uh, you can find me on GitHub and Twitter. Uh, at that handle. Uh, today we'll be focusing on the code first uh, framework. So a quick recap about two ways of creating the GraphQL schema. Uh, the first one is the schema first when we define the types using the, the sch uh, schema definition language. Uh, so we have separated the types declaration from our uh, resolvers implementation and on bootstrap the server like builds the, the, the construct uh, and join the, the, those two together. Uh, but with the code first approach, uh, we define the types and all the operation uh, using our code construct. It might be di direct or indirect, which I will explain uh, later. Uh, so the type definition leaves near the implementation. So uh, we have like the, them, keep, it's easy to keep them in sync. Mm, it's mostly, like usually more flexible, uh, more powerful than the schema first approach. 
uh, and because of uh, using the, the Kofler's approach, we uh, create the constructs on the fly during the, the runs on the, the server bootstrap. Uh, so the, what is the indirect uh, <laughs> approach? Uh, it's basically about the metaprogramming. So we have our code and with some annotations which are providing the metadata for different purposes, like on the left we see uh, the library for uh, putting metadata about the validation. So we have the DTOs that needs to be validated. Uh, and we put the constraints on top of the simple uh, class in TypeScript. On the right, we have the, the curl definition of the entity, a table uh, in database uh, that is also using the, the decorators from TypeScript as a notation to, to put the metadata in the right hand. Uh, so type GraphQL is using the same approach about the uh, indirect uh, generating the GraphQL schemas. So we have like normal TypeScript classes, but with TypeScript decorators on top of that to inform that the class is the object type or input type. Uh, also like the, uh, the different names of the fields because of some, const of some limitation of the type TypeScript compiler, uh, we need to kind of duplicate like the doable uh, for, for the optional fields. Uh, and the main, main uh, thing that type GraphQL is doing is like generating the, the types uh, that correspond, for example, in, in this example of class recipe, uh, it creates the, the object type which corresponds to the uh, type recipe uh, from the SDL you can see on the right. Uh, but it's not also for declaring the, the simple types, it's also for the code field like for the resolvers. So we have like the, the definition uh, of the the queries mutation uh, in our uh, normal classes like the services. Uh, type GraphQL also supports dependency injection using constructor injection. Uh, you can also define like field resolvers for, for different, uh, different types. Um, and also have uh, some built-in uh, capabilities like the out layer built-in uh, or integration with uh, validation frameworks. So in this example, we have the recipe resolver, uh, which is uh, creating, which is declaring the, the corresponding to the, in the SDL, the, the type query with recipes uh, operation and remove recipe uh, mutation. Mm, the second uh, part of, of, of that uh, presentation is the Prisma. Prisma is like using the uh, s schema first approach. So we declare the database shape, the database tables using the special uh, language they call Prisma Schema Language, mm, with all the annotation about the relation, con database constraint, defaults, etc. cetera. Uh, and it's not only creating the mutation, like, uh, like the, mm, the, the <laughs> constructs for, for SQL, but it also comes with the really powerful Prisma client, uh, which is a service, um, a library that allows you to uh, query the database in a type safe manner. So you don't need to write the, the SQL by, by hand, but you can use the, the API that it provides. So uh, the main point of this talk is the type GraphQL Prisma, which is joining those, those two libraries together. Uh, what can we say about the, the, that, that tool? It's basically a Prisma integration for type GraphQL. Um, it's an NPM installable package, so we can find that on NPM. Uh, it's a Prisma generator, so it works like uh, using the, the, the workflow and the tools of the ecosystem of the Prisma. Uh, but mostly important information, most important information is that this tool generates the GraphQL API based on the Prisma schema, so based on the uh, database schema. So how to use that? We, we put the generator block in the Prisma schema file. Uh, the, that's the file when we define our uh, models. So our entities, mm, apart from the standard Prisma client generator block, uh, we need to put the provider type GraphQL Prisma. We can also configure the output uh, of the generated source code because the first, first important thing is that it generates the, the source code. It not just creates some in runtime. Mm, so what does it do? It translates the Prisma uh, schema constructs like the user model and generates the source files, the TypeScript source files, the, the classes uh, with type GraphQL decorators like object type, field, with all the metadata that it needs to, to properly build a GraphQL uh, schema, like the nullable false for, for some optional fields or 
uh, neural true for, for optional fields or providing like dif dif differentiation between the float or int. But not only the, it's not only create the, the simple DTO classes, uh, it also creates the bit naive implementation because we only have like the, the uh, taking the first post of selected user, uh, but it's only for the demonstration purposes. Oh, I think my battery run out. Run out or may I ask to for changing the slide? <laughs> Okay, we have little difficulties here, <laughs> as you can see. Uh, so give us like a minute and we'll try to fix it. Okay, since we are trying to get the presentation back, I actually had a question that I was going to ask after the presentation, but maybe we can talk about this now, so we are not sitting here like just looking at empty screen. I was wondering basically, so when you are generating those CRUD mutations, are you able to overwrite like, you know, part of the execution of the flow? Like if we had to create a user, so I can imagine that we have some like magic building blocks which uh, save the user for us in the database and do like all the logic, but what if we wanted to, you know, add some custom logic to that, like for example, call a webhook after the user is saved or do some extra validation before it's, it's saved. So can we do that with this library? We can, uh, we have like two ways of doing that. The first one is because uh, type GraphQL is focused on classes. You can like extend the class and override the method to put some our own logic called supper uh, that the, the method name and uh, put the logic. Mutation and every step, like every part of the flow is a method that you can override, like saving to database or uh, validation, so it's actually pretty similar. Sounds good. And uh, can you use this library with, like, because I'm not too familiar with Prisma. I know there are two versions, like Prisma 1, which is pretty old, and I think this was kind of like alpha version. Yeah, now, now we have the Prisma version 4, but oh, it's okay. mostly because of the breaking changes being, like, treated seriously. So even some small changes are causing breaking changes, so they bump the version from two to three and from three to four, but it's not like a breaking chain between the Prisma one, which was definitely something different like than different the Prisma, project. Prisma two. Okay. Prisma two is now more like an ORM for TypeScript, mm -hmm. and also for Go, they have the Prisma client for Go, uh, but the, the previous one was like focused on exposing like we are the Docker, not by the binary, okay. so now it's like more flexible. And okay. can you use this library with like uh, the recent version, or you f you support? Yeah, it's it's for the version two and um, and the newer, so three and and now four not yet because th there were some some changes in the internals which I'm using for making the generator. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it's it's mostly focused on the new version, frequently as, as possible. So okay. when they release like in two weeks or three weeks cycle. Uh, a few days later, my version is also compatible with the latest mm -hmm. version of Prisma. Okay. Uh, okay. How are we looking with the presentation? <laughs> I okay. So uh, maybe we have some questions from the audience already. 
we have one. Can I actually do two? two. So the first one is kind of about the this weird uh, weird uh, syntax when you had a provider. What was the path? Because that's just relating to the what, why was it in node modules dot cache? That was just for demonstration purposes because, because basically like Prisma client in the beginning was generating like to the node modules. The goal was like different platforms uh, could have like d different users, different developers could uh, work on different platforms because they are using binary uh, engine. It means that it needs to be compiled on the platform like Windows, Linux, Mac OS. So it's not like committed into the source code. They choose the path of generating the Prisma client from the Prisma schema into the node modules. Uh, so I try to follow that that pattern and also I mean the the surface to node modules, but it's not it's like only the default option uh, when you compile to you know, put the output set the output to the uh, node modules it will uh, transpire the TypeScript to the JavaScript so we can use it in the JavaScript environment. Uh, but if you provide your own path like in the SRC folder, it will generate the TypeScript source files instead of the, the uh, transpired one. And it one. should be safe to commit to... Uh, yeah, and then the source file does, is just normal TypeScript source file, so you can you easily commit that. Uh, but no, it might frequently change because of some... Got uh, it. Yeah. Uh, and the second one is, uh, how do you deal with uh, what usually is an issue for me is uh, when you have uh, recursive queries, like let's say user has friends, friends has users, and uh, does the generator in any way handle that, or do you still have to optimize uh, those queries by hand? Uh, in the first version, I was using the data loader by myself, so loader, okay. but since the, I don't know which version, but like uh, one or two years ago, uh, Prisma built in the data loader into the query engine. So they were like, when you call the Prisma client in different resolvers, they were just l waiting for like 100 milliseconds or the uh, event loop uh, cycle to collect all the queries and build a more performant uh, query. It's mostly work for, for the simple, like the field resolvers, when you have the post and author, author uh, and s some simple stuff. But there's also a really interesting library called, uh, called Prisma Select, which is parsing the GraphQL resolve info tree, so the, the, the information about the query, and translate that to the Prisma client uh, AP, the, the, the object for the Prisma client, so for the query. So we can really put the select for only selected fields uh, and create really, really optimal uh, query. And I am also exploring this, this approach, but yeah, it might be under the, the flag, the configuration option in generator block. Uh, because like in mon if it the, def the default one, then all the custom queries will also need to use that because for the field resolvers, we'll, which are using the normal Prisma query, you can like having a simple logic in the query or in the mutation, return the, the data and everything is working. But for with the approach of skipping field resolvers, so having not lazy uh, resolving of the relation, but ahead of time on the main root uh, query, uh, then it's like spreading all over the, the other queries, so they need to be compatible. So it should be like uh, done on under the, f the flag to not break any existing apps. Uh, how do you use uh, Prisma inside your integration library? Uh, do you use their binary or do they have source code or API for the cloud or you just call the binary comments? Prisma engine is like talking to, to the database when you put the connection URL in the Prisma schema file. Uh, so the, the query is that the engine is binary to, to allow, it's written in Rust. And there, so the goal of the Prisma was to be multi-platform but uh, fast. So it's not like <coughs> they having, uh, the previous version was having the Scala version in the Docker, so it was really slow. Uh, this one is having like the compiled binary in written in Rust and bindings, so the exposing the, the API, the, 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 the Prisma client for TypeScript and JavaScript, and there's also version for Go. Uh, I'm not sure if there are more, but maybe there are some open source projects by, by the community for, for different language. I'm sure if I answer your question. <laughs> of course, thank you. Uh, is Prisma code open source right now, the, bi the, the code that compiles into the binary? Yeah, the, the pr I think the Prisma is, is open source. They have like the Prisma data proxy is basically the software as a service for handling the uh, 
connections limitation for the Postgres, for example, like the, mm, the pool of connection managing that, so they expose like a, a wrapper, and this, this, this one is uh, for now paid, but the, the, the root library is for now open source and then free to use for even commercial projects. Okay, thanks for your questions. Uh, you just earned t-shirts, so uh, yeah, don't be afraid of asking questions. Unfortunately, we need to do a five minutes break, break because like uh, we need to restart everything. We had a uh, little trouble, so I'm afraid we need to uh, end the presentation I, here. I, I can finish from my hand, my head. It's, it's, it's if you want. It's, because it's basically the, the last slides were about the, the, the recap, what we start GraphQL Prisma integration, which we basically define here in the, the QA and section. So it's a, a library that ge automatically generates the uh, GraphQL CRUD API from our Prisma schema uh, and allows not only to quickly bootstrap the project by using the resolvers uh, array, so we can define the data model and uh, quickly uh, run run the, the, the project, the, the server in five minutes, but it also allows for a lot of customization and configuration for, for our own needs, uh, so it's quite flexible and can be used in even uh, more complex projects. And also, because it's generating the source files, it's also always possible to make an escape hatch and like skip the generator, use the generated source files, modify that indirectly in, in the uh, in the resolving the methods uh, if we even even need that. Uh, and yeah, I wanted also to uh, talk about the future of type GraphQL because our panel will be about the the the, the GraphQL. Uh, the things in, in, in the future. So basically, we saw on the slides that there's a lot of boilerplate, a lot of like noise because of the decorators, and that's all because the TypeScript reflection system is a bit limited. It was written a really long time ago, mostly for Angular 2, for the dependency injection, and since that time, it hasn't evolved uh, into more something more so more sophisticated, like in other uh, languages like Java or C Sharp. Uh, so basically, my goal is like to create my own version, like my own tr uh, trans mm, TypeScript compiler plugin, so I can read the abstract syntax tree, read that all the types uh, metadata, uh, and emit that in the generated uh, JavaScript files, so that the Type GraphQL framework can read the more enhanced de the definition from from that instead of relying on manually providing the uh, information like the nullable true or the, the type in, in the decorators, so it, the syntax should be really more uh, clean. Okay, so that would be all. Really, thanks for your attention. Uh, we have we had questions already asked, but maybe someone oh, we have, have more we questions. Have. I'm free to answer. Uh, hello, Roman Prochanko, Alex. Uh, I would like to apologize in advance. I'm really new to, to, to GraphQL and I'm really far away from, 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 from JavaScript and TypeScript and all that uh, uh, something scripting languages. So what I saw is that it's really good to bootstrap a new service, like you define a schema, you get all, most of the stuff auto-generated, auto but my question about uh, how to operate a service in the longer run when you do have uh, more and more and more business logic applied to a service, which could be problematic to fit into the resolver, to, into the resolvers and keep the code still readable. Uh, or another um, idea is that I have seen multiple times in, in, in my experience that sometimes there are some objects that are moved out to some other services. Like for some time as a, start, as a startup, we may have some user management on our own. Then we want to use, for instance, Cognito or uh, you know, something else to, to store the users, and we want to move them to, to other services. How do we, but we still have to keep that API layer consistent so we don't have multiple services in the microservice environment that will suddenly have to change the endpoint they ask. So how do you think uh, you can handle these two cases. One of them is adding more and more business logic to the service and not keeping everything inside in one place in the resolvers, or moving out an object to a different uh, data source, different service. Thank you. I think for evolving, like when we start with the simple project uh, with, with the, on the bootstrap phase, when we really want something to, to be exposed at the beginning, 
uh, we use the resolvers already auto generated, but then we can pick which resolvers we want to expose, like full capabilities, full code capabilities for the user, uh, but only some selected actions. So we may only stick with the aggregation queries or the simple find many with the complex uh, conditions. And having all the mutation or the, the like, the creating and updating, upsetting uh, with our own uh, resolvers. So we are only kind of, for example, in the basic scenario, we can reuse the object type, the the return type of, of the mutation, for example, uh, but we can also use the, the inputs, selected inputs, so we can compose our, our, our own payload, our arguments for the, for the Prisma client query, and like by adding more, more logic, we have more, more custom resolvers, we remove something from the import of the auto-generated one, which are maybe too, too powerful or leaking some, some information, so we can like combine our own resolvers, which are using our own logic, with some uh, like code blocks from the generator, like the, the arguments, the classes, but also having some, some other parts uh, using the, the generated uh, resolvers. For, for simplicity, so we can like gradually evolve uh, towards only using like custom business logic, custom resolvers with the simple help of the arguments of the inputs, the, the classes generated, the simple blocks for from the type of Prisma integration. So as far as I understand, you can use these custom resolvers to, for instance, replace queries to the database for some objects to another service, right? Yeah, you can okay. combine Thanks. them. Thanks. Okay. Thank you for the question. Uh, do we have any other questions? I think we don't. So thanks a lot, Michal. Sorry for the <laughs> troubles. Uh, great presentation and great work with the library. So please give it up for Michal. Thank you.
Hi, hi everyone. So a little bit, a little bit of an explanation of what has happened. This, this meetup, it's quite complex on the setup. And as you can imagine, we are running the event in the live stream, which is a little bit more challenging than the regular meetup. Then we also have speakers joining remotely which we are trying to sort out because this is now, the whole schedule is a little bit um, getting on top of the other speakers, so we are trying to fix that as well. Hopefully all of the speakers don't have other commitments with family, kids, etc. And uh, we will be back uh, very smoothly. So what has happened literally is that the internet went down first, then the slides of one of the speakers stop working, like when that happens, and hopefully nothing else is uh, gonna happen from now. Let's uh, hope everything will be smooth. And we are gonna go and follow with the next speaker, and uh, this is gonna be Jamie Barton, is joining us remotely, and I hope that everything is ready and set to go. Hello, Jamie. Hi, Jamie. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. So if, awesome. you, want, if you want to start uh, your talk, uh, we are looking forward to it. Excellent, thank you very much. Okay, I let's guess. give right. a round of applause to Jamie. Jamie. Hey, thanks very much for having me. Um, I feel like there needs to be some software for running these types of events where it's in person, uh, remote, uh, and everything else that comes with running a conference. It seems like there's different tools to kind of complete all of those things individually. 
but doing it all together is still a complex problem. And then we've got the internet fix as well. So um, yeah, someone will make a lot of money if they figure that out. So I'm Jamie, I'm here today to talk about a product called GraphQL Mesh. Um, if for those who don't know me, I'm Jamie um, and I do training. I have recently started working uh, with the Guild um, to provide kind of training um, through my own um, video tutorials and workshops and uh, blogs and tutorials and uh, that kind of thing. Um, and if you're curious what NoTrap is there, it's just my surname backwards. Um, I always get the question, what's your Twitter handle for? I can never pronounce it. It's just my surname backwards. So yeah, NoTrap. Um, I've been working with GraphQL for a while. Um, I, some of the people in the room there with you, um, probably I, I, I've, met a, I've met a few um, back in the early days of working with GraphQL. Um, and I'm still happy that um, we're all still here um, and we've kind of got through the early days of that and now kind of running, still running events like today um, around, around GraphQL. So fantastic to be a part of it. Thanks very much for uh, inviting me. Um, and just to kind of give a end the intro on myself, um, I do weekly GraphQL videos um, about specific topics that solve day-to-day -day problems um, uh, or working with day-to-day -day solutions uh, in GraphQL. So enough of the history, enough of the self-promotion. Um, I will get on to uh, the Guild. And most of the talk today will be around tools that the Guild have either built or maintain um, today. Uh, the, the Guild is a, a group of open source developers that are committed to uh, sustainable open source, rather. Uh, they're, all of them, uh, all of the members of the guild are experts with GraphQL. There's members come and gone. Um, there's members still part of the, the group that maybe have moved on or have their own kind of co uh, companies and consultancies. Uh, similar uh, position to my own, um, where I'm providing content, but collectively um, I can work with the, the, the members of the guild to continue to improve the GraphQL, the tooling, the support, the documentation, um, tutorials and all that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, if you've used GraphQL uh, in 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 the on the clients in the back end wherever, you've probably used some of the tools of, of the, the guild and what they are building. Um, you know, whether that be with uh, Svelte, Swift, React, Vue, um, uh, and some server frameworks, then yeah, you've probably came across some of the tools. I'd highly recommend that you head to the website to check out um, all of their solutions and services. Another part of the guild as well um, is consultancy, training, workshops, mentorship, technical support, all that kind of stuff, um, where we can kind of be there to kind of give you the support you need to run your business with GraphQL. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm mostly focused on creating uh, content on GraphQL and sharing that uh, and, uh, with, with thanks to the guild. I want to just briefly talk on it uh, very quickly about something that uh, was announced yesterday. Um, if you're working with Svelte, which is a, uh, an increasingly popular tool um, uh, for, for building web apps, websites, whatever, um, if you want to use GraphQL, um, there is uh, a new library or a collection of two libraries, Houdini and KitQL, that was recently kind of updated to work together to provide the best experience uh, with working uh, and with Svelte and GraphQL. So if you've been kind of trying out Svelte like myself and um, uh, other frameworks, then uh, you know, we believe this is the best experience and you can learn all about that at the, the, the website on the blog. Um, and also I wasn't here last month. Um, I had to, um, I, I actually had COVID last month, so I wasn't able to attend to speak, but I'm, I'm very grateful to be invited back. But back then uh, last month, I wanted to just mention that uh, there is a, uh, GraphQL performance monitoring and schema registry service that is the guild's first SaaS product that's now um, available for you to try out. So I can talk and answer questions about that later if anybody's interested. But I, again, I'd recommend that you head to the site to learn to learn more about that. So enough of, of all of that. I want to talk to you all today about three tools um, and uh, what, what how you can use them today, how they've been used in the past and how they've all came together to, to build something new. So let's move on to the first thing. Um, this is the GraphQL code generator. You've most likely used the GraphQL code generator um, in your projects to create types from your GraphQL schema. This is a tool that you can use to generate code for the front end and the back end. You can generate types from your schema and the operations that you create within your project. 
It even works with things like Urkel or Apollo, React, Vue, Svelte, and, and many others. And you can generate the type document nodes that you can use to pass to any one of these libraries, or you can automatically generate the code and the functions and the hooks for uh, the queries, mutations, and, and whatever else you need. And the GraphQL code generator can do all of that by kind of introspecting your schema and figuring out, okay, this is a, a string, and it can kind of uh, you know associate that with your with, with your TypeScript types and, gen and generate all of those, including things like your uh, your different uh, scalar types and and many others. So if you're interested to learn more about the GraphQL code generator. I'd encourage you to check out the website um, to, to learn more about that. The next thing that I want to talk very briefly about is the GraphQL Tools project. GraphQL Tools is a set of utilities that have been around for a while. Uh, they were um, originally maintained by another group of developers, um, but it was the library was over, uh, taken over by uh, the guild, who kind of updated this and, 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 and added a bunch of new things that allowed you to build uh, schemas with GraphQL. It allowed you to kind of bring in the directives, bring schema using the SDL, um, and generate these executable schemas for GraphQL for use in your servers and front end and, and whatever else. It also had tools to mock those schemas as well. So whether you wanted to provide some kind of uh, mock data uh, for type definitions you haven't even implemented resolvers for yet, that's possible with something like GraphQL tools. And you can generate those marks on a per type basis as well, which is pretty cool. Uh, and the other thing was that that's quite big of the GraphQL tools packages is there's utilities there to stitch regular or the Apollo Federation services. So you don't have to kind of pick, you know, one or the other, do I use Federation or not? You can continue to use Federation and stitch together other tools with um, some of the, the GraphQL tool utilities. Um, and you can also stitch together multiple schemas into one API. So you may have heard in the past that schema stitching is dead. Everybody's moved to Apollo Federation and um, we're all federating services in different ways. Well, that's not true. There's still a lot of um, tools that allow you to kind of uh, change and augment how your GraphQL schema works. And that's part of the GraphQL tools. We can wrap, we can rename, we can transform. Um, entire or individual services um, of your GraphQL schema. Uh, and it can also handle loading remote or local schemas. Those schemas could be defined or exported in different file types. Um, it's able to kind of pluck those out, bring all of that together and build a GraphQL schema that we can use. The next thing I wanted to talk about, which is what I wanted to dedicate a full 20 minutes to in the last talk is something called GraphQL Yoga. Now, Tim in the room probably recognizes this um, this was a tool that was um, historically put together and built by Prisma. And over the years, that library kind of became stale, abandoned, and it wasn't very well maintained. That's just because the company that was managing it before kind of moved on and looked to kind of build more abstract things uh, on top of GraphQL, which is totally fine. But it left this huge void. A lot of people were migrating to other GraphQL servers, but people were still doing the same old thing that GraphQL Yoga originally tried to fix which was to bring in all of the different things that people wanted to do, such as file uploads, handling subscriptions, uh, and, and adding kind of middleware plugin systems to this server. So you don't have to bring, if you're using a GraphQL server, you no longer have to kind of wire up these services individually. Um, GraphQL Yoga aims to kind of build this production ready GraphQL server out of the box with all of these features here. The biggest thing for me for GraphQL Yoga, though, is that the server is built around the HTTP request and response specification. So the web's moved on the last two to three years, and now we've kind of got this pretty much uh, good standard that we all follow when handling with uh, requests or responses. Before, the GraphQL Yoga package was kind of tailored in a way that only kind of worked with where it was deployed to in a node environment. But we've all moved on again since then. We're now doing a lot more in serverless and at the edge and, uh, and you know, in traditional node environments as well. So Yoga aims to kind of handle all of that with this very simple setup where it can kind of, it just works with the requests and responses and it doesn't have to worry about too much on the runtime. So uh, the other thing of GraphQL Yoga as well that I should mention is that it has extensive plugin support. So you can drop in any one of the envelope plugins. And if you're not familiar with that, there's tons of documentation at the website. So I encourage you to check that out. But just know if you want to import plugins to augment how your GraphQL uh, execution happens, um, you can do that with Yoga and that's built in. That's how we intend you today to use uh, the envelope plugin system, 
with, uh, with Envelope, you can hook into the pass, validate, and execution phases of GraphQL to do things before and after and change what you need to to make GraphQL work uh, the way that you need it to. Um, and another thing that GraphQL Yoga comes with is this uh, error masking. So if you're um, building a server with GraphQL, you've no doubt seen all of these weird errors come back. Maybe it's even a stack trace um, to your client and you're trying to figure out, okay, why is this even here? I didn't want this error to occur. But with GraphQL Yoga, you can uh, use some of the utilities built in to throw errors in a friendly way. So you can turn on error masking by default, which will exclude anything kind of being leaked to the GraphQL client, and you can just get a generic error back. But if you want to go a step further, you can uh, kind of augment that error with some uh, message that is a bit more human friendly, or it conforms to some kind of uh, I-18 library that your client can pass and show the correct errors for. Um, and then lastly, testing GraphQL is not talked about too much. So I wanted to add this to the slide just to kind of get that in there, because I think it's important that we all test the services that we built. And especially if you're building a server um, in production with GraphQL Yoga, then you want to make sure that your users aren't going to run into you know, little mistakes and typos that you've made. So testing with GraphQL Yoga is very easy with the built-in uh, injection utilities that's there for testing um, and fetching data. Um, you can learn a lot more about GraphQL Yoga. Like I say, I want to spend a bunch of time last time talking about this and going through all of the different examples here, but I, do, I just simply don't have the time today because there's another amazing st speaker up next. Um, so yeah, GraphQL Code Generator, GraphQL Tools, GraphQL Yoga, GraphQL Code Generator, GraphQL Tools, GraphQL Yoga. These are three separate services, but today, we have one. This is GraphQL Mesh, and I'm going to talk to you about this. This is the ability to query anything and run it anywhere. So let's dive in. Just a quick, quick preview into what a schema looks like for GraphQL Mesh. Here we have some sources to find, some plugins, and that's all I'm going to say for now. Mesh is this framework where your services don't even need GraphQL to build a GraphQL schema. Just let that sink in. We believe that you should control your data and your stack and have every bit of ownership around it. And when you don't, you should be able to connect it all with all of the different tools that we have available in the GraphQL space. And GraphQL Mesh is something that can kind of bring all of these things together and orchestrate the communication between everything. So what makes Mesh Mesh? Well, if we take all of our learnings from the GraphQL code generator, GraphQL tools, and GraphQL yoga, we can do something here that allows us to take in some API, whether that be GraphQL or non-GraphQL, and build something that is GraphQL. Then we abstract all of that with the tools package by maybe wrapping or renaming um, individual or entire schemas. We can do that. Maybe we have some configuration that can then declare where this is run. Is it something that will be run on a server? Will it be my entire server? Or will this be an SDK that I use inside of my front end uh, framework? Then we have a CLI that can generate and do all of what I just said. It can generate these artifacts that you can use um, in your production environments. So how does it exactly work? What am I talking about here? Well, we can configure GraphQL Mesh. And if we just remember back to the, the code I was showing you for the configuration, we can configure our data sources. These data sources can be anything. Um, we can define some custom types. We can define some custom results. We use that. Well, we can take all of this to get, we can take all of this configuration, then we can pass it to the build phase. Then that build phase can generate one GraphQL schema from all of these different data sources. We can then generate an SDK output if we wish, and we get TypeScript types for absolutely everything, which is amazing. It's even more amazing when you create TypeScript types for something that isn't GraphQL or has types originally. It's, it's, it's pretty amazing. Then, we pass all of that build to then through the kind of uh, the build CLI to build the artifacts and we get this gateway or SDK. So back when I said uh, about before, GraphQL Mesh composes sources as a single unified, unified GraphQL schema. You can query absolutely anything. So some examples of GraphQL data sources. Whether you're using API, OpenAPI, Swagger, or Microsoft OData, 
gRPC, maybe it's your user MySQL, or you're still stuck using SOAP. You can bring all of these together as your source handlers, and you can build one GraphQL schema, which is just amazing. Um, so yeah, you can use all of these original protocols um, and use them as if they were GraphQL. One example that I used recently was Stripe. Stripe don't have a GraphQL API, but I want to interact with that data in a GraphQL way. Well, using a source handler, I can do that. GraphQL Mesh gives clients the ability kind of to work and talk GraphQL with services like as if they were GraphQL. So let's just talk about these data sources, right? So we could have a mobile application, we could have a web app, we could have a Node.js application, whatever it be. If we need to talk to one of these connected sources, we can go through the mesh. And the mesh handles that orchestration. It handles the communication between all of these different services, which is pretty cool. You can go to the gateway through an API that could be hosted, and it could be your own server that you go to. Or if you wanted to do it in the client, you can use the SDK with something like Next.js. You can just invoke a function, and it will avoid going through this kind of hosted API server, and it will just call your individual services directly in GraphQL with GraphQL, which is cool. And those underlying services could be REST, they could be SOAP, they could be GraphQL, and it can talk as if they were GraphQL, which is just mind blowing. Um, so yeah, we can automatically create these type safe GraphQL APIs from any data source, which is cool. And we can even extend one GraphQL API with the data from another. And another common example that I often see um, or often use when describing this, that is uh, very easy to imagine, is we have an API that we can get countries. We can get the country name, the country code, latitude, longitude, but maybe we also want the weather. Well, if I'm making a request to get my countries, it would be really, really easy uh, and, and, and for me to add weather data from another source. I can extend these resolvers and the types to use data from another. And those are fully type safe as well. When I'm kind of connecting one source to another and I extend the types and resolvers, I can do that within the GraphQL mesh configuration. And it knows what to select using selection set, what data it needs to kind of um, create and, and run that response, which is, which is pretty cool. Um, so yeah, GraphQL mesh allows me to kind of create this single unified GraphQL schema um, from GraphQL sources and non-GraphQL sources. Um, and with what I was talking about with the envelope plugin system within Yoga, we can marsh, we can mock, cache, and uh, apply transformations to the entire schema if we wanted to. So yeah, Mesh does really give you superpowers. So you can query anything, and you can run it anywhere. You can run it as a gateway. This could be a server that you host, which is your Mesh server. Mesh, the Mesh server could be your server, it could be your API, it could be everything you need. Um, and you can run this as a separate service or you could install it inside of your project. Maybe we've all seen the Next.js API routes. Maybe you want to use Mesh, Mesh as a API route handler. You can do that with Mesh. You can get the artifacts and you can expose them over an API endpoint. Or if you just wanted to import the SDK, you can do that. You can import functions to execute any of the GraphQL operations that you need against your APIs. And if you, because of the, you know, thanks to GraphQL Code Generator, all of this is type safe as well. You can generate all of your hooks for queries, mutations, and they are fully type safe. And if you're working with Svelte, React, Vue, Remix, whatever, you've got full type safety when you import all of those as well. So what's next for Mesh? What are we focused on doing? We want to simplify how configuration works. Right now, it's really easy. It's a YAML format that we can do to define how the schema looks. But you want to improve that with directives. We want to actually allow you to kind of build a GraphQL schema that you'd like, and then hook up directives to say, it, OK, this is where you can get the data from, which is going to be pretty cool. We also recently wanted to enable cross-platform support. So maybe it's providing mesh at the edge with Cloudflare workers. Well, we actually just landed support for this last week. Um, so I'm pretty excited that that's there now. And that also has built-in caching support as well. So because we're at the edge with mesh, because we're at the edge with GraphQL workers, we can take advantage of the KV store. We can store and cache our requests with the KV store with mesh. 
and that's all kind of taken care of for you. And it just and, and there's no kind of configuration um, other than what you put in your mesh uh, config. Finally, uh, one thing that I kind of wanted to highlight on what we're focused on doing next is reducing the boilerplate and the kind of footprint that mesh has. So we want to reduce the bundle size for mesh. Um, it's not too big right now, but as you can imagine, as you add more sources, it generates more artifacts, and that's something you've got to carry around with you. But we want to make this super easy and super lightweight that you can kind of just bring this around into any one of your projects, and it just works. There's so much more that we are doing as well, and there will soon be a public roadmap to kind of share all of this with everyone. Lastly, I just want to say that we can federate content from anywhere to anywhere, whether that be through our own API or through the SDK. And if we want to kind of federate all of these different sources, we no longer have to kind of opt into using federation to get the benefits of why we've all started to migrate to build on microservices and build in these federated services and have this kind of larger graph. We can take advantage of Mesh to already have the same advantages of that, but let Mesh take care of all of the heavy work. You don't need to migrate your code to uh, anything um, other than where it is today. It can still live there. Even if it's not GraphQL, it can live there and you can use Mesh to kind of orchestrate and build this kind of federated content layer um, for all of your different sources, which is cool. Um, and lastly, that just kind of means you can stay within the GraphQL ecosystem. If any of this has been interesting, by the way, I've got two videos on both of these approaches. You can use GraphQL Mesh as a gateway and you can use GraphQL as an SDK, like I mentioned. And I have an example uh, using Next.js. So check out my website on uh, those two videos. You can find them on the homepage. And that kind of gets you, gets you started um, with GraphQL Mesh. Lastly, I just want to kind of uh, move on to showing uh, just very briefly the code um, for GraphQL Mesh. So maybe as we've got a few minutes, I can just kind of go through some of these examples. So right here, um, I have open um, a example for using open API in Stripe. So I mentioned this earlier on. And this here, we have a source that we've given a name of Stripe. And then we've given it this path for the specification. Then we've set the base URL. And then we specified any operation headers. So here I can pass, I can pass my bearer token for uh, authenticating. And that's all I need. That's all I need to create a GraphQL schema from this specification. From that, I can then launch Graphical or GraphQL Playground, and we can make requests to this. Then I can generate all of the artifacts that I need um, to use it as an SDK as well, which is pretty cool. You can find out more about all of these different examples uh, in the GitHub repository. Uh, and I also briefly mentioned Cloudflare Workers. Here is a, uh, an example of a kind of a, a function with uh, GraphQL uh, Workers. Here we handle a request, we get our built mesh, we then instantiate a server and we're using GraphQL Yoga. And then we kind of want to change the default behavior of GraphQL Mesh. So we can turn off error or we can turn on, uh, we can turn off the built-in error masking. We can set things like a custom title for our graphical playground. And then we can add our plugins from the Mesh system, which is pretty cool. And finally, we can hand this over to Cloudflare Workers to handle the request as that request and response. There's so much more inside of the, the repository here. Um, everything from using you know, Neo4j, MySQL, Microsoft OData, uh, Next.js, OpenAPI, SOAP, uh, SQLite, Thrift, and so much more. There's so many examples in here on how you can use kind of all of these different things, and you can put all of them together to build one mesh. So hopefully you found this talk interesting. I'm happy to answer any questions about this. Um, so yeah, how was that? was great. All right. Well, thank you, Jamie. I just got a microphone without batteries. <laughs> I guess. Awesome. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot for that. I mean, we got plenty of uh, options and I guess the best is the flexibility that this uh, approach uh, gives you when you want to use all these different APIs. So that seems uh, a great a great alternative to just go and create this uh, from scratch on your own. And also when you are integrating with other teams and 
other projects, that could be a, a really a key um, advantage, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I think working with, if you're on a team that's already using a project that maybe is in GraphQL, there used to be this kind of thing that we all used to say when trying to convince teams to move to GraphQL was, okay, if the front end team just kind of build this layer, then it forces the back end to move to GraphQL and, you know, and then go on to maintain that. But actually now you as a front end developer don't need to do that. You can use the existing systems and get a GraphQL schema, which I think is just mind blowing. It's really cool. Yeah, that also gives you that GraphQL is a solid foundation to build on top and create this GraphQL mesh and all the services that may come in the future. Um, we are gonna skip the break just to try to get some of the time that we got the technical issues. And we are gonna go for just a couple of questions. So if you have a question, yeah, you can raise your hand. So we have a couple of questions here. Uh, hi, the great presentation. Thank you for that. Uh, so hi, uh, we uh, in Marumi, we have this um, project that we uh, join many uh, REST endpoints to create one mutation, for instance. How, how, how can I do this uh, in, in Mesh? Yeah, fantastic question. Thanks for asking. Um, I think what you could do is if you had some kind of uh, open API or swagger for these endpoints, you can you can you can generate those, or you can actually inside of your GraphQL mesh configuration, you can specify what that endpoint is and what all of the resources are as well. So maybe if you don't have that Swagger or Open API specification or anything else, you can define inside of the mesh config what that looks like, and it can then generate the types for that automatically, and then can handle the communication to and from and handle in any transformations you need. Does that answer your question? So my, maybe I uh, rephrase. Um, so, uh, in our case, one mutation that we want to create for our client, like a single page application, uh, one mutation need to do two post uh, requests to two different endpoints. How can I aggregate that with Mesh? Okay, yeah, uh, that's possible with Mesh by extending the resolvers for, uh, for something in there. So, you could create custom type definitions as well and you can overwrite the resolver behavior for that. I think that would be a way uh, that you could achieve what you're trying to do, or you could run multiple um, mutations from your client still. Okay, thank you. And I think there's another question just behind. Uh, hello, I saw you have a MongoDB integration. Uh, so does it make GraphQL exposed uh, MongoDB database? So it will introspect it and you can kind of, again, you can customize um, using kind of what, what we've learned from GraphQL tools to mask and hide. So you can filter out what you don't want to go across um, or be exposed from any source, not just Mongo. So if I use GraphQL mesh with MongoDB, it would give me like a native driver of GraphQL for MongoDB? Uh, I can't remember if it's the native driver or if it's just with the Mongo schema right now. Um, I, I uh, would need to double check that. But and if you didn't want to expose everything, you can uh, just use kind of a whitelist for what you do want to expose. Okay, thank you. Okay, so that's, that's all. Thanks, uh, Jamie, again for joining us. Um, it's a, it's a little bit an effort to join remotely, but uh, we, we are very thankful for that. Yeah, I'll be there next time. Thank you. Bye. Okay, so since we don't have uh, too much time, let's continue with another talk. Uh, so let's have Tim Suhanek on stage. Tim Thanks. is going to talk about um, how we can improve the performance of our GraphQL APIs. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, do I get like a page or thing? Uh, okay. Let's pray to the talk gods oh, that we have internet. We got it. Okay. 
Okay, so we're a bit late, so I need to hurry up a bit. I have a lot of stuff to cover, and I know we had a bunch of topics today already, a lot of interesting stuff. So my, my name is Tim, and I'm the CTO and founder of Stellate. We build production-grade GraphQL tooling, currently focusing on edge caching. And so I've been in the GraphQL ecosystem for a while, started using it in 2016, and since then built a bunch of GraphQL production systems. And there are a lot of ways to make your API fast. And not just your API, but the whole GraphQL system. And I wanted today just share my learnings with you and some things that might be helpful, helpful for you as well. So today we will talk about how to make GraphQL blazingly fast. So the question is, how do I get to the next slide? I hope we're not stuck here. Ah, yeah, there we go. Ah, perfect. So what does it even mean to say blazingly fast? I mean, for that, we should first define the use case. Um, for whom do we want to make it blazingly fast? Am I a user of a web app, maybe user of a mobile app, or am I a build script? Who am I? If we ask Eckhart Tolle, you would say, I'm the observer of my thoughts. But well, that's not very helpful in this context. Before we dive deep into this rabbit hole of performance, I want to just say maybe working on performance is not the most important thing in that moment in your business. Maybe building a feature could be more important. So when you watch this talk online, maybe you want to press pause and check. Here uh, locally, we will just dive into the rabbit hole now. So what does blazingly fast mean? I think I like the definition of Google research where they say that if you flip a page on a, on a website, doing that in 100 milliseconds, that is considered blazingly fast, meaning it's considered instant. Anything that is more like 10 seconds, you will just lose users, e even though you might have a great uh, application and great content. So, but isn't GraphQL blazingly fast? I mean, that's one reason we use it, right? Well, if you look in all the libraries, they will say, yes, they are blazingly fast, and it seems like you just need to choose the right library and you're done with the job. The reality looks a bit different. There are a bunch of people struggling online, Reddit forums, etc., saying that they can't make it blazingly fast and they don't know how. And so today, I want to give you some principles, first principles, so that you can make your GraphQL system blazingly fast. And we will start actually with three main tricks and then we dive deeper into what I exactly mean. Number one is you need to measure. You might not know, but you have some performance bottleneck somewhere that is really huge, and before starting any performance optimization, please measure. Once you're measured and you know where, where the, the culprit is, what, what is slow in my whole system, the next step is to measure again. You know now that maybe your change improved something or maybe not, and then you measure again. So these are my three main points, and the talk is over. No. So of, co of course, more than that. Before diving into actual points now, what you can do, let's talk some numbers. Jeff Dean, smart guy from Google, he came up with these numbers and they apply to basically every web app or distributed system. And the TLDR of these numbers is memory is fast, network is slow. Not a surprise, but we will come back to that later and use that insight, the simple insight, network is slow, memory fast, to make our apps fast as well. So how can we measure? We'll go into load testing, tracing, and performance testing. So for load testing, a nice tool is Artillery. You can install it as an NPM package, and they have like a YAML uh, syntax, and you can fairly easily write GraphQL tests. Here we're sending a Pokemon query, for example. So you get these nice reports, and you know how your system uh, works under load, can run it locally, but also in the cloud. For tracing, in my opinion, 2022, you should use OpenTelemetry. OpenTelemetry is a standard that has been established recently by a bunch of APM providers like Datadog, Honeycomb, and so on. They realize it's not very helpful if everyone has their own proprietary standard, so they agreed on one standard together. So OpenTelemetry is, in my opinion, the way to go. And now, how can you do that in GraphQL? It's still a fairly new topic. The libraries are still um, establishing themselves, and there's just a handful of good solutions I want to quickly talk about Pothos and Zipkin. I'm a bit biased here because the Pothos creator works at Stellate, 
but um, the idea is basically that I can connect Pothos with any open telemetry provider. In this case, I'm using Zipkin, which is an open source, open telemetry sync, uh, sync basically, and I can just run it locally. In production, I would probably use something like uh, Honeycomb. And so, how does this help me now? Uh, a, a use case that we have oftentimes is that uh, a GraphQL query resolves as fast as the slowest field. So if there's a field that takes five seconds, even though all other fields maybe took just two milliseconds, doesn't matter. And just finding that out and finding out why that field is slow, that is something that OpenTelemetry can tell you. Here's a screenshot from the um, Zipkin UI, and we see, surprise, surprise, if we delay by three seconds, it's slower. Obviously, in practice, it's usually not that easy, but this is just to um, show you how it can look like. And then the third topic around um, measuring is actually locally on your machine and testing the performance. So I'm a big fan of the library Beamer. It's built by an ex-colleague of mine at Prisma, Jason Kurt. It's basically, if you, you can say, just for benchmarking. And you, get, you can basically build your suite here, test two different variants of the same uh, solution, and then you get this nice test output. So what I just want to say here is that there are a lot of libraries um, saying we are the fastest library and they give you a very specific benchmark. They usually use these kind of tools that are locally. And it's important to note tracing is really important and also load testing. You cannot uh, replace them. And even though you might use fast libraries, that's not all. You really need to test in production. And another really nice tool I like to use locally is Quokka. Who of you has heard of Quokka.js? Well, a few people, maybe a third I would say. So. Quokka.js is a paid VS Code extension. I'm not paid by them, but I like it a lot. You can add little annotations here as in line 25, 26, you see like the question mark dot syntax, and with that, you can directly inline see how long a function call takes. I really like that to try out uh, quick ideas. So let's recap. We want to do load testing, tracing, and performance testing together. You can't just do one of them. If you just do the performance, the, the local performance testing, that's not enough to know how your production system will actually work. And as I said, benchmarks can lie, and uh, if you torture data long enough, it will always confess to you. So now, what are the actual tricks, what are the actual ways how we can make GraphQL fast? As I said, it's very related, very individual to your server and to your client and so on, but I will focus on some more general topics today. So we will look into the server now and start with the general server architecture in terms of location of the server and the database. We'll talk about data gravity. We'll talk about caching and then the general improvements I won't talk about because, again, it's very specific to your server, but you can use the benchmarking tools that I was mentioning earlier. So we want to look at this query here as a case study, probably a query you have seen a lot in, in examples. It's basically the getting the posts and then the comments for that query. And how can we now do this efficiently? What are the different architectures we can use? Number one, old school. Not yet even using GraphQL, just REST. So we have two round trips here to the server. We first get all the posts uh, with a get call, and then we would have actually more than two round trips. We would have 50 calls. I intentionally made the most inefficient version here where we would get all the individual comments. That's obviously not very efficient, we would have 51 API calls from the client to the server. With GraphQL, we can push all of this to the server, which is still much more efficient, but it's also not yet solving anything if the server and the database have a, have a big distance. And for some of you, that might be totally trivial, but um, having been in the GraphQL uh, forums and chats for a while, I s still see it over and over, people complain, my server is slow, okay, where's your server, where's your database? So just moving the server and the database in the same data center or same region helps a lot. Pay attention on that. We still have this call that is happening. I shot myself in the foot with it. It's super tempting to use it because you save uh, round trips. I usually recommend just using data loader instead, although, although this looks very tempting. And by the way, with Postgres, you can basically turn anything into just one big query. Okay, so we just said server and database in the same location because of data gravity. You want to move compute to the server, uh, to, to the database, and data loader should just be activated by default. By the way, this case where we just have these five queries and we turn it into one, that's called the n plus one problem. 
So let's have a look at caching. It turns out that I'm actually the founder of a caching company, but I want to tell you when not to use it because caching can be complicated. It can make a really big impact on your performance, but sometimes it's not worth it. So when is it not worth it? It's not worth it when you have a low amount of users, it's write heavy, very personalized data, or you have one-off queries. So basically when you can't have a high cache hit rate, um, it's not that useful. And if you, for example, have a dashboard that only three people open, maybe you don't want to implement it. Where caching is very useful, is for example, if you have a high amount of users, uh, a lot of like read heavy, so most of the uh, actual GraphQL requests are queries. And then if you have shared data, then it's very valuable. So examples are e-commerce. I mean, we have the Celia people here. They know uh, why that makes uh, a difference. If you have a critical business path that can be made faster by this, then it's really useful, generally as a, as a rule. And uh, some other uh, use cases that we also see after operating Stellate for over a year now. So you need to decide it for yourself. This is not a rule, it's just a direction that you should take into consideration when uh, you ask yourself if caching is something for you or not. So let's say caching is something for you. And by the way, when I talk about caching, I talk about server-side caching. Client-side caching is still a different beast. Um, I like to see it as full-stack caching, by the way. You can cache it in many different layers. We will now mostly focus on client and edge. So there, the, the caching itself is trivial. What is not trivial is the invalidation, and that's something we want to go into now. There are three main categories uh, how you can inv invalidate the cache. And by the way, just quick um, terms here, purging, invalidating, cache busting, it's all the same. It's just different words for the same thing. Um, let's start with time to live based cache invalidation. So the cache control header, HTTP header, is pretty awesome. It has the max age, which just says you can store it for a minute or an hour. And then it has a feature called stale while revalidate. Who of you knows the SWR library from Vercel? Mm. Oh, OK. Just two people. So there's a library called SWR, short for stale while revalidate. And the idea is really that while this request comes in, let's say after 120 seconds in this scenario, we are refetching the original data. So it's kind of lazily fetching the data when someone requests the data. And we return the actual stale data with that. So that's a pretty smart uh, algorithm. Mutation-based invalidation, this is an example in Oracle. Again, I'm a bit biased because the Oracle creators work at Stellate. But um, the idea is basically you can do it as well in Relay or Apollo client. I have a mutation. And with that mutation, I now change the local state in the client. And then last but not least, you can have uh, invalidation based on the schema. So if I say um, I have a mission here, this is, I think, the SpaceX API. I want to invalidate all the stored uh, uh, queries that have the mission with ID 1. So that's something we, pro for example, provide with Stellate. OK, so recap, we have all of these different uh, mechanisms. And I recommend uh, having a look in Oracle. Oracle has really strong doc documentation around how the normalized cache and everything works. And well, we're doing caching full time at Stellate, so you can also have a look there. Um, and so just to recap all the server work here, we want to first measure. Make sure that we have the base architecture in a good shape. Make sure we don't have n plus 1 problems. And then if caching makes sense, can use it. Doesn't make sense in all cases. And then we can later look into more fine-grained performance tuning. For example, using the fastest framework out there, that might actually not make the biggest difference. OK, so let's move on to the actual problem today, which is perception. So why we do all of this is that actually we want to delight our users. Performance is a feature. And so how can we work on that? I think the perception is a lot driven by the client. And there's a lot we can do. We can use fast frameworks like Next.js. And there's a lot of work with the web vitals and lighthouse scores and so on. But I will focus on the GraphQL related parts today and the, the mechanisms we can use in clients and how to use them. So in Urkel, we can use so-called optimistic UI updates. The idea is really that if I already know what the mutation will return, why don't I already pretend as if the mutation returns so my UI can move on and I don't need to wait a few seconds until the page reloads. So here we are mocking basically, we, we guess the return type 
uh, return response of the, uh, of the backend. Uh, normalized caching is a powerful technique. It is also sometimes a bit, let's say, uh, scary. <laughs> so that's why it's not set, uh, set up by default in clients like Urkel. It can have certain edge cases. Generally, it's very powerful. Relay is um, uh, based on normalized caching, and Facebook uses it very successfully. So there are great use cases for it. I would try it out. Setting it up is easy, but trying it out, there, you might have some edge cases that you need to invalidate properly. Always just refetching from the server won't have these cases, but will also not be as fast, of course. And then there's a new kit on the block, which is also already a bit old, stream and defer. Um, in web development, there's the idea of the fold. So basically anything you see in the initial screen when you load a page, and usually you want to first just load that content and everything else, you want to prioritize lower. And one way to do that on the data level is using stream and defer. So it's a way to prioritize data. Sometimes you know that some data is quite heavy, but as we said, currently the whole GraphQL query needs to wait for all the data. So to speed that up, you can apply the at defer directive to the data that you say, I need it later, maybe when you scroll down the page. So in this case, we say that we want to have the name of the person, but the, um, the home world, uh, <laughs> I think it's the, um, it's the Star Wars API, in, in the home world uh, would be fetched later. And so the payloads are really kind of patches that are coming in step by step. And by the way, this is not yet production ready. Uh, Rob Richard is the, um, is the champion for this, so in a GraphQL working group, you always have a champion who pushes a topic forward and that can take years, and he's on this for years already, so in a pretty good state. It's still a topic of discussion in the working group. They're currently talking about batching stream responses. We might uh, hear more about it later. Okay, well, we just covered a lot. And I just want to cover one more thing. Coming back to Jeff Dean's numbers. So we said it's quite simple. It's clear to everyone if you directly access something from, from memory, it's much faster. Just saving the network uh, request. And so how could we achieve that? Why, how, how about we just skip the web server? How about we, instead of say, saying we go with the web server first, we go with local storage first instead of local storage just being a cache? And that's actually a movement that is happening right now. It's called the local first. Some, who, who has heard about local first? Whoa, okay, four people in the room. So, interesting. Let's see in a year how many people have heard about it. So, the idea really is simple. You store all the data first locally. Uh, the user owns all the data. SQLite is very popular for these solutions. Does that make GraphQL uh, obsolete? I don't think so. You still need to sync all of this data, but this is just an interesting approach that just popped up a few years ago and is now becoming more and more popular. Uh, there is one library called, I think, Aphrodite, if I pronounce correctly. Riffle is a um, research project that also a friend of mine, Johannes, who is later in the, um, uh, in the discussion, uh, works on, and he also did a great talk a few weeks ago just to focus on this topic. Local first is really interesting. Defer directive instead of just splitting the query. What is the advantage? It's basically syntactic sugar. So you could indeed spri uh, splat, uh, split queries, and we do that quite a bit in our like analytics dashboard uh, at Stellate, but it is getting a bit ugly, and it's nice to have this within the language. Um, it's also very useful for stream, so when you just have, let's say, a few thousands of rows that you want to stream in, but you want to already show something, you might just need 20 to show the initial. Stream is also quite powerful for that. It's basically making it easier. You could also do it with uh, separate queries, yes. Mm, won't it break a lot of software, like uh, GraphQL Code Generator, for example? Why? Be because uh, because uh, then the payload is split to two different results. Yeah. What you have is that basically everything that can be streamed is nullable. So that's why you as a client need to say, if you say at the first stream, you could also say that the server knows themselves if something is slow. And that's, by the way, uh, also a point of discussion in a working group. Should the server be able to ignore the at defer? So if the server says, I have all the data, I just give it over to you, 
Um, and I think the answer is yes, currently. But it's more like the client says, I don't need the data right now. If you are busy with it, give it to me later. And with that, it, it's basically nullable, although it might be a required field. Thank you. Yeah. OK, maybe we can have one more question. At what level the differ annotation is planned to be added? added? Is it at the specification level or library? Um, so it's already implemented in GraphQL.js. There's a PR open for it. You can try it out. I know that the C-sharp implementation has it. Um, so there are these, um, I currently don't know the stage of it. You can look it up on the, the working group uh, repository. Uh, okay, yeah. thanks. Yep. Okay, thanks a lot, team. So one more round of applause for team. Um, uh, all right, so we had three amazing talks and uh, let's have a very short break now, like three minutes. Um, and after that, we will continue with a video uh, of Lee Byron that he sent uh, sent us, and then we will go to the panel discussion. So, see you in three minutes.
Uh, so we actually
Hello, I'm sorry not to be able to join you today, but still pleased to participate and share some of my thoughts on GraphQL with you via video. My name is Lee Byron, and I'm one of the creators of GraphQL, as well as the founder and director of the GraphQL Foundation. So first, I want to give a brief intro and update about that foundation itself. So GraphQL was originally created at Facebook, but in the first couple of years after being open sourced, it was becoming pretty clear to me that we would need to treat the project differently from Facebook's other open source projects. In particular, GraphQL was implemented in over a dozen languages by a broad community. So a project like React, where we could just make a decision and roll it out unilaterally, GraphQL couldn't really do this without risking significant divergent changes in behavior across the ecosystem. And similarly, we couldn't really just accept and merge PRs to improve the project. We would need the help of this whole ecosystem to help move along together. This has been true for a while. So at the first dedicated GraphQL conference back in 2016, I introduced a new development model based around individual champions, introducing well-documented proposals discussed in live working group meetings, which we still hold monthly. Also, when we were creating GraphQL back in 2012, we weren't really thinking about a future in open source, and we had filed patents on the core concepts. So patents can take years to be approved. So of course, they were granted shortly after we open sourced. Uh, this, along with Facebook's not so popular modified BSD license, it just it created a lot of fair concern about how other companies might be able to use GraphQL without facing some potential looming legal issue in the future. Luckily, we were able to solve all of this. We relicensed the spec and our code and had formal patent grants. And uh, most of the people who were giving us criticism about this rescinded that and said that they were very happy with that relicensing. But it was a mark and, and becoming clear of, you know, just because of the way that GraphQL ecosystem worked, GraphQL being owned by one company was just probably not really going to work very well over the long term. So in 2019, shortly after I left Facebook myself, I got all of the legal ownership of GraphQL transferred to a newly founded GraphQL Foundation. A foundation's goal is to provide a neutral home to the project and a sustainable maintenance model. There's three key groups of people who help us do that that are part of the foundation. So the first is the GraphQL Foundation Board. This is a board of representatives from companies who contribute funds annually to be members of the foundation. So if you hear someone saying that they're a member of the GraphQL Foundation, that's exactly what that means. This board meets monthly and they're responsible for everything except technical decisions. So mostly they get to decide on how best to use our shared pool of funding. So we do things like host events, we run a grant program, and we do all of the other things that a company would otherwise do to ensure a long-term health of an open source project like legal structure, project management, etc. We're always looking for new members, by the way, and this is a great way to support the GraphQL project. So if your company uses GraphQL and wants to contribute back, please consider becoming a member of our foundation. The next group that's really important is our working group. So that same development model and working group that I talked about um, that we put together back in 2016, that exists to this day. And the foundation has given us a firm legal contribution framework that ensures that anything contributed by one can be safely used by all. Unlike the board, this group is open to anyone who wants to join, not just members of the foundation, and costs nothing. So if you care about the GraphQL technical roadmap and you want to see the project itself evolve, this is exactly the place to do that. And then finally, we have our technical steering committee, our TSC. This is a much smaller set of people who are voted in and are essentially our core maintainers and our administrators of the GraphQL technical projects. So a handful of folks we hear from later today are actually members of our technical steering committee. They thanklessly keep our projects in good working order. So part of the reason why I wanted to share a little bit of, of detail on the foundation is, first of all, it's the majority of where my time and energy goes into the project these days. My priority has been not just to see GraphQL evolve and add features, but I want to make sure that it's sustainable and it's a well-resourced, stable base atop which we can build a healthy ecosystem together. So all of you here today at this meetup are a great sign that that's going well, which is awesome. But it does also give a little bit of context into why the development of GraphQL works the way that it does. So a lot of the questions that I get are about why some specific pull request isn't getting merged right away, or why some feature isn't getting added despite some well-articulated need, or asking about how to get a change onto the project roadmap. 
The simple truth of it is that the foundation is just a framing for us to operate in. We still definitely rely on community members to drive these significant changes across an ever-growing ecosystem. So all of the improvements that have been made over the years and the work that's all currently in flight, which there's a lot of really interesting things in flight, are all thanks to specific individual people who brought those improvement ideas to the working group and have worked diligently to ensure they roll out well across an ecosystem successfully, which is no small task. But anyhow, onto the spicy topic that our organizers have lined up for us. Is GraphQL a trap? First of all, let me say that I really agree with this critique. GraphQL really can be quite difficult, especially when it's looked to to solve problems beyond what it was originally meant to solve. I found it really common to hear people frustrated to find that GraphQL doesn't solve access control, rate limiting, query optimization, logging, caching, error recovery, backend modularization, cross-service interoperability, and a lot. I hear you. Building a resilient and capable service or architecture of services is no small task, and GraphQL is certainly no panacea. In some cases, it can even make these kinds of problems harder to solve. There's trade-offs involved. So there's plenty of folks here today that I'll let speak about the progress that's being made on some of these problems alongside GraphQL, or how to sidestep them, or when you might even decide GraphQL isn't the right technology for the problems you face. But when I heard this prompt, I immediately thought of a story that I wanted to share. So shortly after releasing GraphQL in around 2015, I think it was probably late 2015 or early 2016, a bunch of other companies were starting to implement it. And they would reach out to us to ask if we could come visit and talk to their team and answer questions. So one afternoon, my teammate Dan Schaefer and I headed up to San Francisco to meet with some of the engineers at Pinterest who were building a new GraphQL service. They were a really smart team and they had built something pretty great and they had really smart questions for us. But it was really surprising to all of us that a few of these questions were actually not really about GraphQL. Dan and I often found ourselves answering with, you know, answers like, oh, at Facebook, GraphQL isn't really responsible for that. Or, uh, oh, right, that problem, it's an important problem, but it gets handled somewhere well before the GraphQL layer. And then eventually, you know, hey, would it be helpful if we just outlined how our whole API layer works overall, including GraphQL? Um, they were very excited about this idea. So what followed was kind of an epic diagram that took up this whole giant, like, you know, four meter wide whiteboard. Um, that was our whole app architecture. It covered data fetching, schema stitching, access control, rate limiting, and a whole bunch of these things that they were asking about. And it was this whole technology stack that had been built up over the course of years. And then finally, there was GraphQL as like a thin coordination layer that sat on top of all of this. And it was the most recent addition. So what stood out to them most was how we were doing data fetching and schema stitching. So Pinterest was painstakingly trying to build this really complicated query planner. It was really smart, but they were getting frustrated with how difficult it was and some of the poor performance that they were seeing with a small handful of their queries. They thought for sure that we must have had some brilliant GraphQL query planning technique that surely we could teach them about. But they were kind of taken aback that we did not have any kind of thing like that. Um, what we were doing was a much simpler sort of like a dynamic programming approach, which batched and cached requests to the underlying services. And it had good enough guarantees about worst case performance, and it scaled totally fine to support Facebook's extremely high usage rates. So with that meeting a wrap, Dan and I, we were walking out of the Pinterest office, you know, we were feeling pretty inspired by our discussion. And we were talking about, you know, our, our experience talking to the team. And we realized that while we were really enthusiastic about GraphQL, that a mountain of value was the software underneath it, all of the things that we were relying upon to make our GraphQL service at Facebook work. And we hadn't really spent that much time talking about all of that. And in particular, this layer that coordinated data fetching seemed like something that we could fairly simply rebuild in JavaScript and share to talk about. So we actually walked straight into a coffee shop and wrote out what would become the first version of Data Loader, which is still broadly used by many production GraphQL services to coordinate data fetching under the hood. So anyhow, this is the story that came to my mind for a few reasons. First, it was a reminder that when we originally saw GraphQL as a simple coordination layer, Others were expecting a lot more from GraphQL. So GraphQL alone won't solve all problems. And it's really critical, actually, to have a well-designed architecture that addresses the concerns that you need. 
And then also, it was a great example of how our first intuitions for solving a problem are not always the most appropriate. Query planning was actually a completely reasonable place to start. That's, in fact, how most query languages work. And there was a great opportunity for best possible performance when done well. But the concern wasn't actually how to optimize for best case performance. It was actually a concern around protecting against worst case performance. And that's where our discussion took us. So all of this to say, yes, GraphQL can definitely be difficult. Uh, and you could even say that it could be a trap. But at best, I think GraphQL is a coordination layer that sits atop a well-designed service. And of course, that's no small feat. So rather than ask, how could we do this the GraphQL way? Maybe we should be thinking about saying, how would we do this in a general way, but in a way such that GraphQL could easily layer on top of it? But anyhow, again, thank you for having me here virtually and enjoy the rest of the event. Okay, thank you, Lee. If you ever have a chance to watch our stream, uh, we really appreciate the video. Uh, so let's now continue the discussion. Um, uh, so tonight uh, we have um, three uh, panelists with us. Uh, everyone uh, is experienced GraphQL user, let's say. Um, so we have Patrick Zawadzki from Sailor Commerce. Hello. Welcome. Uh, we also have Johannes Schickling from Prisma, uh, founder of Prisma. Um, Hi, Johannes. Can we have Johannes on screen? Can you hear us? Seems yes. Can we hear you, actually? I can hear you. I'm not sure whether you can hear me. Yes, we hear you. All right. OK, third time. Hello, everyone. <laughs> um, and we also have uh, Michael Steib, who uh, is a um, member of the technical steering uh, committee, which makes him a GraphQL core contributor. So uh, welcome, Michael. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> so uh, I wanted to start with um, the question that we asked um, Lee, uh, is GraphQL a trap? And uh, from here to discuss, what do you guys think about like common misconceptions that uh, people have about GraphQL? Um, like uh, Lee said that in his opinion, this is like a thin layer just at the, on the top of, you know, rest of the services and some people expect a lot more from GraphQL. So uh, what, what, are, what is your view on that? Uh, maybe we can start with Johannes. All right. Um, yeah, happy to throw the first stone here. Um, so I think GraphQL is sometimes or was historically, I think sometimes overused for more situations than it's actually a great fit for. And so I think this has like led to some counter reactions where people now have an opinion about GraphQL for use cases was never a great fit for in the first place and then maybe uh, drew the wrong conclusions. So I think it's, it always matters, like as, as always in engineering, it matters about your, your use case, your situation, and then you need to pick the right tool for the job. Um, so, and I think there's a few situations where GraphQL is an excellent tool um, for, for the job. Um, and so I think that that's sort of like the, the most important foundation. And then on top, I think there's just GraphQL was a solution for more situations in the, in the past where right now we maybe see some better solutions or like some architectural shifts. Like if you see it in, in a situation like in a Next.js app, Remix app, etc. Now we have like new data, data mechanisms. And so this is where GraphQL might be more work than what you would have used before. Um, and so this is where it might, might have gotten a bit of a, of a bad rap. Um, but I think it really depends. I think it's actually an opportunity to let people use GraphQL for the use cases where it's actually good at. And I think this is where people will have a really great opportunity, uh, a really great time with it. So that, that's sort of like my, my first take on it. And I'm curious what, what other people think. Yeah, I think that's uh, quite a heated way to, to start. But we just skipped the introductions. And I think we should just go um, a quick round of intros. Um, 
maybe we can start with you um, and then we we can move so all of the all of the guests are properly introduced all right uh, so again I'm Patrick uh, my name is Patrick Zawadzki I am the CTO and co-founder of Sailor Commerce and I'm here because I work with Martin obviously but also because Sailor Commerce has a vast uh, GraphQL based API and we're also a member of the GraphQL Foundation so uh, we experience a lot of the problems that the tooling tries to solve and uh, it's probably true that for each person here uh, in this room and every uh, other member of the panel who are connecting remotely we're facing uh, different problems uh, but I think it's quite a feat that the uh, specification is good enough that uh, it helps all of us and it's interesting to me also to see what problems we may not be seeing because we're, we're commerce faced so uh, the, the problems we see are uh, kind of specific it's a, it's a very narrow niche that we're working in uh, but a lot of those solutions could be repurposed and uh, a lot of solutions that were originally created for different problems uh, are quite inspiring and we can sometimes uh, reuse them or even figure out that we're actually facing a problem uh, that we didn't realize before so uh, one one example being data loaders that are quite obvious now and everyone uses them uh, but it were they were introduced and they were considered a novelty back then so so thank you for having me yeah you're welcome okay so let's go to Michael yeah hi guys I'm uh, Michael Stipe as already introduced I'm a GraphQL TSC, but I'm also the um, co-founder of Chili Cream. And essentially, we built uh, the, a lot of GraphQL tooling, but we also built uh, the .NET implementation called Hot Chocolate. And uh, this is one of the, I would say, most modern GraphQL servers that is out there. that already has uh, most of the features that will come along in the next three or four spec versions. Excellent. Anything to add to what we are discussing? Oh, yes. Uh, so is GraphQL a trap? I think it's a bit about expectation. So um, if, if you think about uh, how Lee introduced GraphQL as a sin layer over their application layer, and that's actually where GraphQL is great. It gives us a much richer way to expose our application layers. Like if you think about the REST way, we always had to compromise, uh, like use a lot of DTOs, package them. Uh, so we had a lot of different patterns there. So often when you see is GraphQL, where, where people say GraphQL is a trap, it's uh, when people just move from uh, REST to GraphQL and reuse the patterns that they use uh, in REST. Like they maybe use a lot of CRUD and uh, this is not maybe the best uh, thing in GraphQL, or there's an expectation from the graph uh, from the database first uh, kind of people where they essentially take the database and do the O data thing, just uh, see GraphQL as a kind of a better way to serialize SQL, and I think if you do that, bind your models just to um, to a database you run in a lot of um, problems uh, around uh, the way. It was not designed for that. Like, for instance, OData was designed for querying uh, essentially databases or serializing SQL over the wire. But GraphQL was actually de designed with a completely different mindset. So the mindset of we have a rich application layer and we just want to make it accessible um, by users over the wire. That was the main intention by Facebook. Okay, thank you. Um, Johannes, so you already expressed your view on that, but maybe you want to add a little bit uh, more of a context of uh, your experience with GraphQL. Uh, we know that you are a founder of Prisma, but I'm sure there is much more. Yeah, so I, I have quite a quite a rich background with GraphQL. So I was one of the the, the lucky earliest users, I think, just when it uh, just when the the spec was released, and there was just like a very bleeding edge reference implementations, and so you, you had to just dig around for like a, code code usage examples. So I've been 
uh, giving it a try since then and then really jumped on the bandwagon and, and saw uh, all the problems that it addressed and got really excited about it. Got so excited about it that I um, started a company uh, around that back then. It was called GraphPool because I thought GraphQL was cool. Uh, anyway, uh, I guess get the pun. Um, <laughs> and so later that turned into Prisma, but we've uh, spent quite a couple of years uh, really like very deep in the, the GraphQL ecosystem. We also started the GraphQL, uh, GraphQL Europe conference, where I think maybe I, I might've met a bunch of you already. Uh, was was a really great time. And so, yeah, I've kind of saw like kind of multiple generations of like GraphQL technologies and approaches, like some approaches that were tried out and then uh, didn't really quite succeed. And I think now GraphQL has, has found more its footing. And I think also has found more of like some core use cases where it really shines. For example, I'm personally very excited that companies like GitHub have embraced GraphQL, where if you want to actually build something on top of GitHub, it's so much nicer uh, than using the REST API, even though the REST API is actually pretty well documented. So I'm, I'm very excited for that. Um, and um, yeah, I, I hope that um, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic that if we see continuous investments in the GraphQL ecosystem, in particular also around the tooling, that um, GraphQL will be even easier to, to adopt. And uh, some of the uh, some of the haters around GraphQL as a trap might also have a bit of a softer stance, um, but I, I fully understand also the, the point that GraphQL was overused for some use cases where it's uh, not the best fit. Um, so yeah, that, that's my, my current take, but, but happy to, to see where the conversation goes. Okay, we, we are actually uh, discussing tomorrow morning with Gerard, uh, what's the like current um, phase or status of GraphQL and um, there is actually this chart maybe we can have it on screen um, which shows you know different phases of uh, basically a lot of different things and um, like I remember that a few years ago like um, 2019 or 18 we saw this you know hype uh, for GraphQL everybody was talking about this everyone wanted to use it everywhere basically uh, but after those few years, I think like we are already a bit farther. So um, people are still using it. Um, like we saw that uh, many companies like Airbnb, PayPal, um, Shopify, and many, many more are actually in the GraphQL Foundation. So they invested a lot of time and money uh, into it. But like I think we are over this hype phase, and I wanted to ask you, like, what's your view on that? Where are we with GraphQL? Is it considered stable now, or are we going to, you know, change anything in the future in this technology? Is it safe to uh, use it now uh, and invest time and money into this? So maybe let's start with Patrick. Yeah, so since I'm the CTO of a company that's based around GraphQL, I think my answer is going to be obvious. So I think, yeah, it's, it, it, is, uh, it is worth spending time, it's worth spending money, it's solved a lot of problems for us. And uh, to maybe first uh, refer to the previous question, I think GraphQL is often misrepresented as being either the library or the HTTP stack, but neither is part of the specification. So GraphQL is actually a way to turn a string into a data structure. It's not even JSON at output. So the HTTP bindings of, uh, of uh, GraphQL, they are a specific, uh, specification that's separate from the core. Uh, Relay is not GraphQL. Apollo client is not GraphQL. Apollo server is not GraphQL. So, so I cannot speak to you know all of those technologies, whether all of them are excellent, uh, whether you know it's it's equally good to spend your time using Apollo Server or GraphQL Yoga. That may not be true, but the technology itself is sound. It's it's proven. Uh, we've been using it uh, for for years now. You know best because uh, you were the first one to implement a GraphQL Server in Sailor, but. Uh, but again, if, if you consider GraphQL as the technology of turning a query that may originate from, from outside your company and turning it into a response that, that enabled someone to do something useful, that it, it's an amazing technology. So yes, my, my answer is yes. 
Okay, thank you, Patrick. Uh, Michael, what do you think? Uh, where do you see like the GraphQL uh, roadmap going, and uh, you know what's what's the status of of the technology? So the technology. Um, so there, there are two things. Like uh, we talked about adoption peaks. Right in the early phase, we had a lot of uh, hip internet companies taking on the technology. And uh, that is that is like the hype phase. But now we have actually companies like IBM, like Microsoft joining the GraphQL Foundation, like the enterprise companies. And if you look at them, like Microsoft um, built uh, Microsoft Teams on top of uh, GraphQL and also their office products are now built on top of GraphQL. So it's not only the, the hip internet companies like Airbnb using that, it's now the enterprise companies. Also, um, I read, a, read an article that a couple of teams at SAP are using uh, GraphQL now. So you can see it's going into the enterprise sector and that means GraphQL is getting more mature. Um, if we're talking about roadmap, it seems so, um, that GraphQL uh, didn't iterate so much, but it's actually not true. If you think about it in the perspective of Facebook, so there was not the Big Bang where there was GraphQL and it was a major shift. Actually, it was a lot of iterative changes that they did. So the first change that Nick Schrock did was essentially allowing productions on their ENS API, and then they iterated on that. And it was just felt by the community when they released in 2016 uh, GraphQL to the open source or in 2015 announced it essentially. So it felt like a tectonic shift, but it actually wasn't. It was a couple of iterative changes. And um, I think GraphQL still progresses in that way. We have a lot of iterative changes. Like we have a couple of good changes in the last spec release, like um, that we can now chain directives, we have uh, repeatable directives, and uh, we also have other things. If I look in what is in the pipeline for the GraphQL spec, it's huge. Like uh, we have the one of um, input type that is coming for input polymorphism. Then there is stream and defer coming. And I think that is one of the most exciting features that will come. Um, I mean, Tim said it's just syntactic sugar, but the uh, it's not as if you have two requests because you have everything over a single HTTP post stream. So it has a lot less impact on your network. That's why different stream is important. And there, there, you can, with that, build completely new use cases. So that is very exciting. But then if we look even further into the future, what we are discussing in the GraphQL working group, we have client controlled nullability, essentially error boundaries for the user in, the, in GraphQL queries. There's things like fragment modularity uh, that we are talking about, object identification, essentially formalizing what Relay does with the node type into the GraphQL spec, but without uh, forcing people to implement an interface. So there's a lot of things coming. I think uh, GraphQL is, is um, developing rapidly, but uh, it's, it's a lot of iterative changes that are coming over the next um, couple of versions. Uh, sounds very good. Uh, personally, I'm waiting for uh, this feature where you can deprecate input types. That would be really great. I'd love, I'd love that. Uh, for now, we are just adding comments uh, in input types. Uh, but that's that, that's essentially possible, right? Uh, I mean, that is merged. Uh, so, so putting a deprecation on an input field is essentially merged. Yeah. So it's but, accepted if if you use a, a lot of GraphQL servers already have implemented. Mm. So that actually brings me to one of the questions. Um, like I wasn't going to ask originally, but uh, I was wondering if there is a way, or maybe you were discussing a way of unifying, you know, set of features that are supported. Is there a way to actually achieve that? Because you know, you have so many different frameworks, um, and you have this one spec and the JS implementation, which is like the reference. But is there actually a way, or you know, have yeah, you we. I mean, we have the reference implementation, but uh, in order to move f features forward, we always uh, demand that there is a non-GraphQL.js uh, implementation that uh, implements these features. 
that's uh, where often uh, we as Trilcream do it for .NET because uh, if you do it in .NET, it will work in Java as well because it's very similar. So, um, like from the programming model, um, so most of the features I talked about you can use today. So if you pull down the newest hot chocolate version, it will just work. Uh, but to enforce that on um, all the tooling, it, I think is not um, realistic. So there will be a couple of implementations uh, that implement very early. And what I can personally see is you don't have to implement like um, the next spec version. Like if there is a GraphQL uh, 2023 or 2024 version, you don't have to implement the full spec version. Um, you can just implement a couple of these features. Like for instance, maybe you don't want to have defer and stream. They are totally optional. So you can implement them, but you don't have to implement them to be spec compliant. Um, and that also allows like adoption, like if there is a feature accepted, which goes into the next GraphQL specification, uh, implementers already can pick that, like um, deprecation on input fields. You can implement that today. Uh, also, you could go for any draft feature and start implementing that. And that's, uh, I, w I wouldn't say that you have to enforce that every feature of every version of GraphQL has to be implemented. Right, so we have another question here on our notes and we were thinking that if we were to implement or design GraphQL today, what are the ideas that you would put in there knowing so that, what has happened and that some features were missing some features were approached uh, in a certain way and then because we have also the memory of this past few years uh, do you think that there's something different that would be done today on on that task of designing graphql I mean, that's always a tempting thing. Let's start on a green field. And I think it would totally uh, um, drive against the wall and, and crash and burn. Because uh, if you look why GraphQL is successful, it's because Facebook had a use case. They had a problem to solve. And they did a couple of small iterative changes to their API to solve this problem. Like Data Loader, for instance, is not developed for GraphQL. It was the way uh, Facebook already used this tooling. Uh, I don't remember the name anymore, but they didn't call it data loader in the begins, beginning, but they used it already in their REST API. Uh, and they essentially did a lot of iterative changes to arrive at the point where they had GraphQL. So a lot of small iterative changes brings a major shift to technology. It's not that you have to like uh, start on a green field and uh, do these things. They often go, I would say, south. Um, so while there could be things that uh, if GraphQL were done on a green field, we could um, introduce a better way to have a shared type that is shared between input and output. We could think about differently about input polymorphism. Uh, but at the same way, you always go over the top with that. Then if you, if you start on a green field, you want to solve so many problems and then um, you solve in the end nothing. So I think where we are with GraphQL is exactly where we should be. And I think uh, that these changes that are coming will at one point do the next shift because the features that are lined up that we are working in the working group on they will uh, totally change how we can interact with GraphQL. But not in the, in the way that we introduce breaking changes, as I said, in a way that we add small iterative changes over time. Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, Johannes, maybe, uh, what's, what's your view on that? If you were, you know, like from the perspective of those few years of using GraphQL, would you, uh, I don't know, change anything or design something differently if if we had a chance, you know, like to reiterate over this uh, specification now. So I, I completely agree with Michael that um, why GraphQL uh, turned out to be so great from the beginning actually is like that Facebook had a real use case, a real, um, a real need to solve a problem and they've like naturally solved it and this abstraction emerged it. And then rather like 
looking at like what it's already there, then it was formalized more and then it was turned into a spec. And I actually feel um, the GraphQL spec is almost like a bit of a poster child from compared to like other technologies that are equally um, massively adopted. But uh, GraphQL is, like has so many nice processes, like has a foundation, et cetera. So I'm, I'm pretty impressed with like the spec part, the working group, like everything. And a lot of that is just also like the, the amazing work that, uh, that Lee is doing of like, uh, like leading like that. That's really like his, his thought child. Um, so, but, uh, if, if anything, if I would wish not for someone to do something differently, but I, if I would wish that something would have gone a bit differently is that I think in GraphQL right now, and really the same well right now, the weakest link in all of it. Um, and you have to look at this from like a per language ecosystem perspective, but me looking at it from like a JavaScript type TypeScript ecosystem perspective is the integrated tooling experience. And in my opinion, it's not very integrated. It should be much, much, much more integrated. If you think of like a couple of other technologies that were really, really successful uh, over the last couple of years, I'm thinking of like TypeScript in combination with VS Code, et cetera. Why that's su such a great experience is because it's so tightly integrated. Like for better or for worse, one company uh, puts a lot of resources behind it and make sure everything is like, like if there's a new VS code release, it comes with a new TypeScript version and it just works. Like you open a project and it works. And with GraphQL tooling, the state today is like every company says like, hey, and like Prisma in the past included, uh, says like, hey, we're gonna build a new tool. And then there's another company which says build a new tool, they overlap. And even if they don't overlap, they don't just seamlessly integrate. There's like tons of VS code plugins you need to install, like tons of like little CLIs that you need to wire up and it's not nicely integrated. And I think this is uh, what a comp, like this is where GraphQL, the spec and like the idea is really just half the battle that Facebook um, like shared with the world. But I think if you use GraphQL within Facebook back then, I'm not sure what it is right now, is it's really like where it unlocks the full power is because it's so nicely integrated. So integrated with relays, integrated with their remainder of the data layer. So it's really like one aspect of a larger story. And we are right now just looking at GraphQL as like one sliver of the story, but we're missing the integrated rest. And very few companies I think ever get to a point where you have such a nice integrated story. And this is to bring it back to the initial question. This is what I would wish we, where we would be at a different point right now where everything is much more seamless and much more integrated. Um, yeah, that, that's that's my, my current take. And I, I think actually the biggest weak spot of GraphQL right now. Uh, thank you, very interesting point. Uh, Patrick, do you have anything to add here? Like, what do you think about this? Or or is there anything you would add or you miss right now in, in GraphQL? Yes, so, so for me it's also about the developer experience. Uh, I greatly miss a way to, for example, uh, expose some metadata about the API. So I would love to have a, an introspectable meta type that would, could tell me additional information and some custom fields about uh, fields resolvers uh, to maybe, I mean, because we have enough introspection to generate language bindings for, for GraphQL. We can generate uh, bindings for dynamic languages, static languages, this is all amazing. Um, but we don't have enough tooling to say, call or a query to show you which fields are the most costly. Or uh, to tell you that the field you're uh, using requires a special permission maybe. Uh, so I would love to be able to extend the information I give about the field uh, with data that, that we currently have to put in the description, which means they cannot be parsed automatically uh, by computers, they cannot be used by the tooling, we, we cannot use them to you know, visualize uh, data about our queries in, uh, in VS Code, for example, uh, like Johannes mentioned. So, so number one for me uh, would be getting uh, metadata, and number two would be getting feature flags, because if you're writing a client, you would really like to know which parts are implemented, which I understand were not a problem uh, that Facebook was trying to solve initially because they controlled both the client and the server. So, uh, just to, 
just to interject here. So feature flex is being discussed. So that's uh, an issue we are working on in the in the working group. It's if you, if you look at the pull request, it's the at experimental directive. But uh, that was the initial proposal. It's going more into the feature flag area. Uh, and actually introspection, like extending introspection, you could do today if you wanted to. It's just some client tooling has a problem if you do that. But uh, technically, from the spec perspective, you can extend these types. And there is, like, we are doing work to formalize that. There, there, there's a solution that uh, GraphQL Java and Hot Chocolate, for instance, implement, uh, which allows you to introspect already directives, uh, type system directives. Um, but at the moment, it's a couple of proposals. So uh, there is work being done on that. Uh, if I may answer, uh, I, I am aware of the work uh, happening around uh, the metadata that's already actually, there's a draft uh, spec for this because extending uh, the introspection schema is not enough because there is no way to represent this in uh, SDL. The standard JSON uh, notion for, for schemas doesn't convey this information. So. Um, so it's a bit more than just uh, implementing new fields in the, in the API. Uh, it's a bit like, so the, the, the current approach that we did for, uh, like in GraphQL Java or Chocolate, uh, that, we, that is one of the ap uh, approaches there is that we do what you do with default values. So what you do with default values is essentially uh, serialize uh, it into GraphQL SDL for input types. Yeah. Um, because we have a problem that uh, input types cannot become output types. Like uh, what you have in a, in a directive essentially is an input type. And now you want to have this value as an output type. That's it. That's the essential problem there. Uh, and what uh, we, we have done with this applied directive approach is that uh, we do the same like we do for default values. We serialize it into a string and then you can deserialize it on the client type. But this is not ideal. So there is discussion in the GraphQL work group around uh, an object type, like an input object that actually can traverse between in and output. Um, but that is early, that's an early discussion. So there are a couple of things and that is in GraphQL, we don't wanna break uh, future uh, users so uh, or past users. Like if you introduce a new server, it shouldn't break your current clients. That's why it sometimes feels that the working group is dragging their feet on these kinds of features, but it's uh, making sure that what we put into this bag actually works uh, works in a way that it's backward compatible. But there's work being done on that and uh, a lot of discussions being done. Yeah, I think it's a good, it's a good state when we are discussing features that are not really um, being to be supported, but these are more around tooling. I guess that's a good indication that GraphQL is solid. It's a reliable technology. It's a solid foundation. And yeah, we can change uh, how we use the tooling. And of course, not everyone is Microsoft that can work on both the tooling and also the technology, which is a, a, big, a big advantage. Um, I think we we are gonna give you the chance to get into the discussion. So I don't know if you have any questions around what we have been talking, or maybe you have a question to our guests. Uh, hello, I don't know if this is the right question to this panel, but what's your plan to increase the adoption of GraphQL, uh, for example, in schools and universities? Anyone wants to jump? No. So, yeah, I mean, I, I can... Um, Jump in if nobody wants to. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, go ahead. Like, uh, I wouldn't just look at universities and uh, 
schools uh, as a particular use case. If, if I look over the, the complete industry, I mean, GraphQL is everywhere. Uh, why don't you see that? Because actually, uh, most GraphQL APIs are private. Like look at Twitter, for instance. Uh, if you look at the requests, if you look at the responses, you can see, oh, that's, that's a GraphQL-like response, but they're using something called persisted queries, advanced persisted queries. So essentially, you are sending in a hash and on the server's already the GraphQL query pre-compiled. And, um, and then you get already the response for that. So most GraphQL APIs are private. Like even in the case of GitHub, we have a public GraphQL API, but that's much smaller than their internal GraphQL API. Uh, why is that? Because GraphQL also um, has a lot of attack vector if you have it like a public API without the need to being it public. And most companies don't need a public API in the sense of uh, that everybody could use your API to do anything with your API. So most, most you have a mobile application and uh, this mobile application should use your backend. Um, so I think from an adoption standpoint, we are quite good at the moment. It's, it's, it's stable and a lot of, uh, as I said, inter enterprise companies are going into GraphQL. Now. As for schools, uh, what we do, um, like here in the universities in Zurich, we went there and explained to uh, the first years uh, on, on the university what GraphQL is. So there is traction, but it's up to the community to do that. So if, if uh, there are GraphQL public speakers, they also can uh, go to the unis and talk there to get the technology into the next generation. Yeah, I think GraphQL has a pretty nice um, education uh, set of resources. Um, most of the documentation that you can find available, not even paid uh, education, is is quite brilliant, actually. And I think the people working on this documentation, they have done a, a pretty good job. And there's ready, readily available for, I mean, I don't know if schools are using this documentation, but uh, any developer that wants to build using GraphQL they have plenty of resources, they have uh, live queries, you can uh, change a query and see the results. I mean, most of the documentation are, are brilliant, I think, on, on that, on that uh, side. I don't know, what do you think? I think it's the same problem I mentioned previously. Uh, like, there, there's tons of very good tutorials, but they fail to tell you what bits the stack uh, is composed of and which parts you are being taught as, you know, this is the actual GraphQL, and this is the choices that the author of the tutorial made for the sake of, you know, having uh, a server, having a client, and so on. So, uh, it's pretty easy to get into GraphQL, but it's pretty hard to get the most out of GraphQL, because you have to take the advantage of, of Relay if you're choosing Relay, you have to take advantage of uh, Apollo's uh, caching if you choose Apollo's uh, for your client, so, there is not really one GraphQL that you can learn. It's it's a ton of different niches that solve different different problems. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think is it even if is it even our goal to populate GraphQL as a spec? Like, would we be here if we were only here to you know to discuss the specification itself, not mentioning any libraries, not mentioning any servers, uh, tooling, you know, clever uses of uh, of the technology itself. I don't think that that's all that interesting. So, so it, it would be like a course of, you know, RPC or a course of web services. I don't think it's that interesting. Uh, what's interesting is solving an actual problem and for that you need an actual stack. So, but to get back to the original question, I think the problem we may be having is uh, you know, the technology being mistaken for the tools we use to, to interact with the technology. But I'm not even sure that's, that's an issue because I don't think, you know, GraphQL as a thing in itself is, is very interesting. 
Okay, I think we need to stop right here, although the discussion is really cool. interesting and like we could discuss for the next 30 minutes, <laughs> but we are uh, running out of time and we've been like uh, talking here for three hours already. Uh, so I'd like to thank you a lot uh, for joining our discussion, uh, Patrick, Thanks. Johannes and Michael. Uh, it was great having you, so please give it up for our amazing guests. Um, and I think that's it for the 10th edition of GraphQL Wrocław. Uh, so, uh, yeah, as I said, thank you to our panelists, Bye. thank you to our speakers, uh, Michał, Jamie and Tim. Um, we have an after party, actually, in Marinka. Everybody is waiting for that, probably. So one important thing, uh, make sure to wear those stickers with your name because uh, this sticker gives you one free drink in the bar. Uh, so uh, we see each other in five minutes, in, or five to ten minutes in Marinka. Uh, lastly, I want, I, I want to say that we are going to continue this event, but we are thinking about like uh, expanding our scope, so GraphQL won't be the main topic of our events, but maybe one of them. Uh, we want to basically discuss more uh, uh, topics in the area of web development, app development, uh, and techno technology in general. Um, do you have anything to add, Jared? Um, I think that we survived the technical issues. And uh, even with the difficulties, we pull off a great event, taking into consideration the live stream, the remote speakers, and having you here with us. So thanks again to everyone, and hope you enjoy the after party. Thank you.